Come on. Pastor, preacher, phenom extraordinaire. Give it up for Stephen Furnick. Thank you. Look at y'all. Thank you so much. You can be seated. Fantastic. Hey, I was just here to preach at Celebration in um, May. And uh, like y'all been on steroids <laughs> since I came. This is phenomenal. Look at this, man. Look at this. Such a great, great church. I'm looking forward to being here. I watched y'all online last night. Kind of wild in here last night. By the way, I just want to say to you, you talk about how good of friends we are. Um, friends don't make friends preach after Bishop <laughs> T.D. freaking Jakes. He called me and invited me to come to the revival. He didn't tell me that part. <laughs> hey, 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 Stephen, this is Stovall, man. I was wondering if you will come out to the awakening. <laughs> Did I sound like him? <laughs> hey, hey, Stephen, this is Stovall, man. I want you to pray for me. I'm on day 73 of my fast. And <laughs> hey, St hey, Stephen, I want you to follow T.D. Jakes. It'd be all right, man. It'd be cool, all right. <laughs> no. My admiration and respect for you is undying and it can survive all things. And uh, really, um, two things I wanted to say uh, to you, uh, Pastor Stovall, and uh, to you, Pastor Kerry. The first time I heard about him was a friend of ours, a mutual friend of ours. When he heard I was starting a church, he said, if you can, um, if you can see one church before you start your church that I think exhibits the kind of spirit and an enthusiasm for souls that you're talking about your church um, demonstrating and um, the kind of church that you say you want to be with, with the book of Acts coming alive in your day. He said you should talk to um, this guy named Stovall Weems at Celebration Church. And um, I do, man. I feel, like this is, I feel like this is family to me. It feels like... Um, my vacation church, <laughs> where you pay the bills. <laughs> I can relax here, preach, and have fun. And then to you, Carrie, um, my wife actually said this sentence, and she's watching. Have I told you lately that I love Anyway. Hey, babe. I was... I was talking to her after the first time you spent time together, and I said, do you like Carrie? Because I really like Stovall, and I hope you like Carrie, and uh, so we can be double friends. And she, she goes, she goes, as a matter of fact, I'm more than like her. If there is one pastor's wife that I've met that I would want to model myself after as a mom and the way that she runs her home with integrity and skill, it would be Carrie Weems. And I hope that we get more time together. That's what she said. I know every speaker that comes is going to say nice things about them before um, they preach, but it's in order. What you fail to celebrate will eventually exit your life. So you've always got to, if you're going to call yourself Celebration Church, you've got to start by celebrating the leaders God has given you and never take it for granted. You're a gift to our generation. You're a gift to me. You're a gift to Banana Republic. Please turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 46. We're only going to read one verse out of 1 Kings 18, and then we're going to read some, um, some verses in, in chapter 19 and then stop and preach a little bit, read some more, and so forth. Instead of a message title tonight, I want to use as my title uh, a central question, 
And the question that I, I want us to answer in our time together tonight is this, that the, the title, if you need a title for the message, but really the question of this message is, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And um, I'd like you to, if you want to write that down, write it down, and then turn to the person next to you and ask them, uh, what are you doing here? Turn to your second choice other neighbor and ask them, what are you doing here? Hey, do me a favor. Look back at them and say, it's none of your business what I'm doing here. I could, I could come to church anytime I want to come to church. Get off me. <laughs> I love y'all, man. You are phenomenal. I go to a lot of churches. I've never seen a screen that big. That screen is the size of the lobby in my church. What have you done, Jesus? What have you built here? This is amazing. Oh, thank you, Lord. I just bought this big notebook to write my sermon notes in. Is that the biggest notebook you've ever seen? So I can preach long sermons. Three people are excited about my long sermon. No, no, it's too late now. I don't want your pity applause. It means nothing if I have to force it. I want your, I want your willing love. Okay, 1 Kings chapter 18, uh, verse 46, and then I'm going to read some stuff from chapter 19 as well. I'll just jump in and read it, then we'll establish the context after we've read it. The scripture says, The power of the Lord came upon Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Now, verse 1, chapter 19. Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he'd killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. He himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Let's just read half of verse 5 and then make some comments. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. And I really wanted to call your attention to verse number three of all the verses that I read, because to me, it's one of the strangest verses in one of the strangest sequences in all of Scripture, where the Bible says in 1 Kings 19, verse 3, Elijah was afraid. Elijah was af afraid. Now, the reason that verse is strange is because if you were to poll the average person of Elijah's day and ask them to describe Elijah, the prophet, who appeared like a stab of lightning in the, in the sky. He just, in, in 1 Kings 17, shows up on the scene with, with a sort of resolve and tenacity that was uncommon even for prophets. If you were to ask the average person of, of the Israelite community, what's one word you would use to describe Elijah. They, they may have used a lot of words. Like if you're playing Mad Libs with Elijah's life, I don't know if you remember Mad Libs or not. I got a seven-year-old, five-year-old. In fact, my seven-year-old is named Elijah. And uh, I named him after this prophet because he was so bold. And, and if you were to fill in the blank, Elijah was adjective. You, you may have said bold. You certainly would have said bold. Because he was the one who, who stood up in front of the king, Ahab, the king that we read about in verse 46, that little verse I picked up in chapter 18, he stood up in front of his face and said, it's not going to rain in this entire land until I say so. Shut off the rain supply of heaven by the power of a prophetic word. That's pretty bold. And now... The, the rain has fallen on the land because Elijah went up on a mountain called Mount Carmel and, and, and challenged the prophets of his day, the, the false prophets of his day, the prophets of Baal, the prophets of Asherah. This was a fertility god, kind of like a sex god, if you will. 
and an agricultural God that the people believed could bring them success or could, could bring them some sort of pleasure or some sort of fruitfulness. But those gods couldn't do it, so Elijah called them up on the main stage.